All right, today is, is the 14th of September, and I want to welcome Gary Bruston to the Grizzly Peak Cyclist. He's a very experienced attorney, and we'll, I'll leave it to you, Gary, to share your background and proceed with the presentation. Thank you. And Michael, thank you very much for the invitation to make the presentation, and thank all of you out there on Zoom for attending. Let me just take a couple minutes here to give you some background information. I have been a cyclist for a long time. My first road bike was a twin varsity. And some of you might even be old enough to remember that bike. Luckily, I've been able to upgrade over the years and I still try to ride three or four times a week. From a professional standpoint, I graduated from Hastings Law School in 1975. I've been in private practice ever since. And for the last 25 years, I have exclusively represented injured cyclists and specialized in bicycle law. I've also been pretty active in sponsorships. Over the years, I've co-sponsored organizations like the Race Across America, Velo Girls, and the Silicon Valley Bike to Work Day. Finally, I am a big fan of bicycle advocacy. I think it's gonna make the roadway safer for all of us. So I volunteer my time to organizations. I started out uh, probably 25 years ago on the California Bike Coalition board. I was on their board for about 10 years. I then moved on to the League of American Bicyclists out of Washington, D.C. I was on their board for nine years, and I'm now completing my 12th year on the board of the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. So that's basically my background and uh, short summary. Uh, I think uh, we can now move on to the more important things in this talk. So the focus of the talk is going to be twofold. Number one, I want to try to teach you how to avoid these bike accidents. And number two, we're going to talk about what to do if you're unlucky enough to get into one. The topics are gonna to be common accident patterns because I believe if you know the most common ones, you'll be able to watch out for them. Next one will be motorist excuses and I want you to use those to your advantage. Next one will be what to do after a collision, what you should do and what your lawyer should be doing. And then we'll do questions and answers. And I think Michael told me uh, at the beginning of this talk that uh, if you wanna uh, ask a question during the talk, it's fine. If I can take it, I will. If not, perhaps we'll defer it till the end. Okay, let's get started here. Common accident patterns. Without a doubt, the, and once again, this is not scientific. It's just that I've been doing this for over 25 years. I've handled well over a thousand cases and these are my office statistics. So without a doubt, the number one cause of bike accidents is a left turning vehicle. It's just amazing. Probably 70% of my cases involve this. Here's how it winds up. You're approaching the intersection. Car is coming from the opposite direction. It's slowing down. If you're lucky, it's signaling. And just as you get to the intersection and enter it, what happens? The car makes a quick left turn. Well, the law is pretty clear. First of all, as bicyclists, we have the same rights and responsibilities as other vehicles on the roadway. And we have the right of way. That vehicle should have yielded to us. So now that we have the law on our side, that's one thing. But let's talk about some common sense. How are you going to avoid this accident? I've learned over the years from my clients and other people that probably the way to do this is just as you're entering that intersection, instead of looking down the road another hundred feet to see your next hazard, double check the vehicle. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make eye contact. Well, a lot of times you can't do that anymore. The front windshields have these uh, reflective glazes on it. A lot of motorists are wearing sunglasses. So you really can't rely on that. What you can rely on every single time are the front wheels of the vehicle. Are they moving and in which direction? So hopefully this will sensitize you to the intersection left turn. But the left turn comes in uh, different varieties. Here's the next one. I call it the mid block left turn and I get a lot of these cases too. Here's how it sets up. You're riding along the right-hand side of the road and, and I'm gonna cite a case that, that, that I handled and actually the rider was in a bike lane. A car is coming from the opposite direction and traffic is backed up at a red light. And of course, motorists are very courteous, so they open up a gap so cars can turn left into a side street. Well, what's gonna happen when the cyclist gets to that gap? That motorist is gonna shoot through that gap. They don't go through slowly, they just go cruising right through. What's the law on this? Well, it's again, it's the left turning statute. Left turners have to yield oncoming traffic with the right of way, and that would be us. But there's also some case law on this. And it says, when you 
make a left turn like this, you must go lane by lane to make sure it is safe to do so. So I had a case, probably one of my first cases years and years ago, I call my little old lady from Pasadena case. And she was a little old lady from Pasadena, sweet woman, lived in the neighborhood for decades. And she had made that left turn almost every afternoon because she goes out to the market or the pharmacy and her, and her house was just down the street. So she turns through the gap, my client is injured. The insurance company says it's not our fault. And uh, you know, it's the bicyclist's fault. So we proceeded and I take her deposition. And I asked her, you know, Mrs. Jones, how long have you lived in the neighborhood? She goes, oh, for decades. And I said, you know, have you made that left turn before? She goes, oh, all the time. And when you make that left turn, did you know there was a, a bike lane down there with bicyclists riding? Oh, she goes, I knew that, absolutely. I said, as you made the left turn, did, did you ever consider going very slowly past that second line of cars to make sure you, you wouldn't hit any bicyclists? She goes, no, I never considered that. I said, well, well why? She goes, well, listen, I'm in a car, they're bicyclists, I have the right of way. This is a preview for motorist excuses. And I want you to know that uh, as recently as about a year ago, I heard the same thing uh, from another motorist in this situation. So when you get here, when you see a gap in traffic and you can't necessarily see what's going on to the left, and as you know, everybody's driving SUVs these days, please be extra careful, slow down, pass on the right very safely, to make sure you don't get caught in this situation. Because if you are going too fast, and if you do hit the car, even though the law is on your side, you are gonna sustain some very, very serious orthopedic and dental injuries. And obviously you don't wanna do that. Okay, what is the next one? If it's not a left turn, it is going to be a right turn. And this is a situation where the car is always in front of you. So picture this, the car is at a red light, you're coming up the street and you see a red light. Now as cyclists, what do we do when we see a red light at the intersection? Well, we start slowing down because we wanna time that light. The last thing we wanna do is actually have to stop and put our foot down and then restart. So just as the cyclist gets to this position on the slide, the light turns green and the motorist makes a quick right turn. And the cyclist is trapped between the right side of the car and the curb. Let me stop for a minute. Although this is a relatively low speed accident, the injuries are substantial. I've had cases where clients have had total knee replacements, total hip replacements, and I've even had one case where there was a fatality. So please give this special attention. Well, what's the law? The law is a vehicle has to signal for at least hundred feet before making a turn. And the vehicle must commence that right turn as close as practicable to the right-hand side of the roadway. This vehicle didn't do it. So how do you avoid this accident? Well, as you're approaching the car, you can certainly check for the turn signal, but it's been my experience that most turn signals on most cars in California are completely broken nowadays. So I probably wouldn't recommend that. I would go back to check the wheels, check the front tires. Are they moving? Are they turning to the right? <laughs> Be very careful if you would in this situation. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's go on to the next right turn. This is the overtake and right turn. So you're in front of the vehicle, you're approaching a green light, and then all of a sudden the car comes up on your left. And instead of kind of proceeding through the, the intersection, you hear it somewhat speed up unusually, and at the very last minute, it makes that quick right turn. Same problem, same kind of injuries, the law is the same, the motorist clearly violated your right away. But how are you gonna avoid this one? It's really tough, I gotta tell you. I think that it really just comes down to, in some circumstances, what we call situational awareness. And we've ridden long enough to know when something very unusual is happening to our left or behind us. So please be sensitive uh, to this situation. I'm gonna give you one more right turn scenario, which uh, now that traffic is getting busier again after the pandemic, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing it again. It is the imaginary second right turn lane. So it sets up with cars on, on, on all the gray cars at the bottom here in a right turn only lane. Now the black car couldn't, probably couldn't squeeze in or, or, or butt in line. So the car decides, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just make the right turn from the left lane. This doesn't happen very often, but it's beginning to happen. And it's usually an overtaken right turn. So please, even though you think you got clearance 
and you're getting through that intersection safely, like this bicyclist is, once again, use your common sense. If you think something's going wrong on the left, be extra careful. All right. I am sure that most of us have had a close encounter with a car door or have been hit by one. I, this is so obvious the way it sets up. You're riding down the street. All of a sudden, you just get to the rear bumper of a car, and at the last minute, somebody opens the car door. Or shall I say, they fling the door open. Nobody opens them slowly these days. And all of a sudden, you are trapped. You hit the door, and you go down. The law is pretty clear. You cannot open up a vehicle car door into traffic until it's safe to do so. And once again, we are traffic. We have the right to be there. Let me briefly tell you about a case I worked on uh, uh, years ago uh, in Berkeley, a young man who was a graduate student uh, was coming home from school, probably about five in the afternoon. He was on a relatively busy street. And he's a very mild-mannered computer scientist. And uh, he's riding along, and sure enough, at the last minute, that door flings open. He tries to swerve out of the way, but he still hits his right hand on the edge of that door and sustains a very serious permanent right-hand injury. So I filed the claim and the insurance company said, well, you know, it's just not our fault. It's the bicyclist's fault. So we proceeded and we went through a hearing and uh, uh, it all turned out pretty well. But let me tell you what the defense attorney's arguments were. She gets up after my final argument. She says, it's not our fault. It's the bicyclist's fault. And here is why. Number one, he should have been looking in the rear windows of all of these cars as he passed them to see if there was somebody in there who could open the car door. The next one was due south of this roadway, this busy, bu busy business district was a very quiet residential street. You know, why wasn't he using the residential street? It would have been so much safer for him. Let me stop for a second. We have the right to be on almost every roadway in California. There are exceptions, freeways, some bridges, but for the most part, we have the right to be on any road. The next argument was he was going too fast. Well, you know, if he was going two miles an hour, it still may have happened, but she made the argument anyway. And her last argument was, as he was passing each of these cars, he should have been looking at that little side mirror on the door, the left door, to see if he could see the reflection of anybody sitting in the car who might open the car door. So we conclude the case and luckily we won and I'm walking out and I said to the defense attorney, I said, you know, I've been doing this for a while and I've heard all those arguments, except for the one about the little side mirror. How did you come up with that? And she said, well, you know, as I was leaving the office this morning, one of the other attorneys said, why don't you try to argue that he should have looked in the side mirrors? <sighs> Here's what I've learned. Defense attorneys know if they throw enough arguments up, sooner or later, one of them is going to stick, especially against the bike rider. Unfortunately, we don't step into the courthouse uh, without strikes against us. And I think we all know why, and I, I don't want to go into great detail about it, but if you want to stay afterwards, I'll give you a mini lecture on why the motoring public uh, doesn't have a lot of respect for us. But just so you know, uh, we won the case. It was hard fought. Uh, but but be ready for anything in these bike cases from the defense because uh, they know that they can sometimes squeak by. Uh, and one, one other thing, I have a lot of people on the defense side that I know, uh, they're colleagues, they're not my enemies, they're your adversary. Uh, so I'm not really uh, trying to say anything uh, negative about them. They're doing their job and uh, sometimes they win and sometimes they don't. Luckily, we've been prevailing over them most of the time. Next one, side swipe. I'm getting fewer and fewer of these cases every year. And I finally figured it out. And I'm sure you have too. Bicycle advocacy, the three foot passing rule. Motorists actually know about this. So I'm getting fewer and fewer of those cases, but I am still getting them. But I wanna tell you about two cases, side swipe cases that will educate you about how important electronics are nowadays in evidence in these cases. The first one is a case where my client is riding Saturday morning. He's riding in a bike lane. He's going up to the hills. He's gonna do his usual loop. And all of a sudden, before he knows it, he's slamming into the pavement. What happened was a utility truck was passing him. And some of those utility trucks have those very wide mirrors. It was the mirror that caught him. 
He goes crashing into the roadway. The truck stops, thank goodness, helps him out. And we try to proceed with the case. And they go, no, we really don't think you've got a case here because the truck driver is saying that the cyclist swerved in front of his truck. You know, I hear this over and over again in these cases sometimes, swerved in front of the truck. Well, we looked for independent witnesses. We couldn't find any. Uh, there weren't any building cameras back in those days. So it was basically my client's word against the truck driver's word. But my client was an engineer. And these are in the early days of Garmin. And he said, you know, I've got some data. I said, well, really? Because I, even I hadn't even learned about it yet. He says, let me show you. I will, trend, I will superimpose my data on a Google map. I said, great. And he did. And sure enough, he didn't swerve at all. So although we didn't have uh, a live witness, we had an electronic witness, which was very, uh, very important. We're going to talk about preserving your data later. Let me talk about the second case. My client and one of his good friends are riding around Lake Tahoe. They're doing the whole lake loop and uh, they're riding down the road. My client's in front, his friend's behind him and a truck comes up behind him, passes his friend safely and then starts to proceed to pass my client. And my client told me, well, you know, the truck came pretty close and I thought it was okay. And all of a sudden the next thing I know, I'm flying over a guardrail. So what happened in that situation? He was hit with a trailer. And that happens, unfortunately, quite a bit. Uh, it was a utility trailer, but I've had uh, horse trailers, boat trailers, all sorts of trailers hit my clients. And the unfortunate thing about this was not only my client's injuries were, were substantial, but the truck kept going. It was a hit and run. So his friend behind him was so, so upset about the situation, obviously, uh, he, he ran to his friend to help him and the truck just went down the road. However, his friend had a digital camera on the front of his bike and that told the story. Not only did it show how the accident occurred, but it got the license plate off the back of the trailer. We gave it to the police and pretty much the rest is history. But the digital camera in that situation and in numerous other hit and run cases I've had have been extremely important. I recommend that everybody keep a digital camera running on the front of their bike and believe it or not, on the back of their bike. I know it seems a little excessive, but if I can get that kind of video, uh, it really makes the cases work a lot easier. All right, let's move on to our next one here. Let me take a look. This is, uh, without a doubt, the most dangerous situation in bicycle accidents. It's called a high-speed rear-end collision. You are riding along the right-hand side of the road as close as you can to the curb. And all of a sudden, the car comes up behind you and it drifts over to the right and hits you. I can tell you that almost nobody survives this kind of accident when the cars are going 35 to 45 to 50 miles an hour, unfortunately. So how does this happen? How in the world does this happen? When I give this talk live, I ask people, what do you think? And they raise hands. Well, everybody's texting nowadays. Everybody's checking their email. Oh yes, I've had those cases, but they are the minority cases. The majority of the cases, without a doubt, the number one cause of this fatality is a drunk driver. And a lot of times it's a hit and run. They just keep going. The second major cause of this accident is somebody who's under the influence of illegal drugs. I had a case recently where a young lady was killed by somebody who was very high on heroin. The next one is somebody who is under the influence of legal drugs. I had a case where a young lady had a medical condition. Her doctor gave her a prescription for Xanax. She took her first pill that morning. It wasn't quite kicking in, so she took another one way too soon, uh, got into her suburban, drove down the road and hit two cyclists. Unfortunately, one didn't make it, the other one uh, uh, had a brain injury. So how do you avoid this accident? I, I really don't have any uh, clear answer for this, but I would suggest two things. Support advocacy organizations so we can get more protected bike lanes. 
And number two, uh, support uh, nonprofit organizations such as Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and also organizations that will help these people with addiction. All right, let's move on to one more scenario here. And it is man's best friend and cyclist's worst enemy. I'm sure all of us have had more than one close encounter with a dog on our bike. Give me just one second here. I'm seeing some things going on on my screen here. I'm not sure if I should be uh, paying attention to them. Well, okay, uh, let's move on. So before I go into how this, how this works in the law, I want you to know that the injuries in a dog case are usually pretty simple. The dog gets into your front wheel or back wheel, you go flying over the handlebars and you break your shoulder. Now I know it's horrible, but compared to other injuries, uh, it, it, it's on a lower scale. But be aware that I've had some clients that have gone over the handlebars and even with a good helmet, have suffered a brain injury because of a dog accident. So be very careful when this happens. Now. What's the law? The law is that if your dog is in public, it has to be controlled on a leash. It's just that simple. Obviously, there's some exceptions like a dog park, but for the most part, it's got to be on a leash. So the way it normally lines up is you're riding down the road and a dog comes charging off a porch, usually from your right, and goes flying into your front wheel. And you go down. Let me take a quick time out here. I want you to know after doing these cases for 25 years, I have never had one client bitten by a dog in these situations. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the dogs really don't want us. They really want the bright, shiny object and they're chasing it and it could be territorial. So once again, when I give this speech live, I, I ask people, well, what do you recommend? You know, how do you save yourself? I always get, you know, Take the water bottle out and squirt them with a water bottle. Back in the days when we actually had pumps on our bikes, hit them with a pump. Other people say, use pepper spray. Uh, other people say, well, you know, outrun them, uh, which I really don't endorse because when you do hit the roadway, you'll be going faster rather than slower. I've even had one client uh, who was carrying a, a, a handgun that he thought was legal in California, uh, shoot at a dog. Thank goodness he missed it. Uh, but the dog did scurry off. Here's what I recommend, and you may or may not agree. If you have a dog coming at you and it is not a vicious dog, and you know a vicious dog when you see one, slow down and get off your bike. Put your bike between you and the dog. I think the dog is gonna get bored pretty quickly. Now, hopefully it will. Uh, and, and if it just keeps barking at you, well, then start walking away and get out of its territory. So those are the suggestions that I've heard from clients. These are the suggestions I'm giving you because I don't want you to be severely injured. Uh, but please, when a dog comes at you, it's a very, very serious matter. All right, let's move on to motorist excuses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Without a doubt, the number one excuse that I hear from motorists is, I never saw the cyclist. You know, the first time I heard this in a case, I said, oh, that's just gotta be made up. Uh, but after I've been doing it for decades, I hear it all the time. They really don't see us. And, the, and, and, the, and most of the time I hear it in, believe it or not, the left turn case. We're coming right at them in a bright jersey. And some of us even have daytime running lights on our bikes, which by the way, you legally don't have to have it, but you legally can have it if you want. But they still say the same thing. I never saw the cyclist. The next one is, I never heard the cyclist. Well, I know we don't have horns on our bikes, sometimes bells, but I can assure you we make a very loud noise just before impact, unfortunately. The next excuse is, I didn't realize the cyclist was and I believe this one is going so fast. I'm sorry, we're kind of getting a little overlap here on the screen. Uh, I wanna make sure I'm getting this right for you. Right, I didn't realize the cyclist was going so fast. They think that we are like they were as kids on beach cruisers going around the neighborhood at five, six, seven miles an hour. The next one was the cyclist was going too fast. We hear this all the time in the gap left turn case. Uh, 
Well, and, and of course, we talked about the Berkeley case where they said, well, if he was going slower, he wouldn't have hit the door. He could have looked for it. The next one is the cyclist should have been in the bike lane. Well, what, they, what they're really saying is, and by the way, there is a law that says when there's a bike lane on the roadway, under most circumstances, you must ride in the bike lane. There are exceptions to that. But what the motorists are really saying is, unless there's a bike lane on the road, you shouldn't be there in the first place. Next one is, uh, and I'll just read it to you uh, off my notes. The cyclist should have been on the sidewalk. We don't hear it very often anymore, but we still hear it. The next one is the cyclist. Why wasn't the cyclist on a residential street with less traffic? Again, that's the Berkeley case and the door, the door situation. And the last one is, wasn't the cyclist supposed to yield to me? The little old lady from Pasadena case. And like I said, as recently as a year ago, I heard somebody repeat this. Unfortunately, the motoring public still hasn't been adequately uh, educated. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna give you one more uh, and briefly explain it, then we're gonna move on. I thought cyclists were supposed to walk their bikes across the street. This is the situation where you're riding along the roadway and you wanna make a left turn. So you start crossing lanes of traffic and you get into the left turn bay and all of a sudden you're hit from behind in the left turn bay. And the motorist says, what are you doing here? You know, aren't you supposed to ride up to the intersection, push the button for the crosswalk and walk across the street? We don't see it a lot. Sometimes they'd say that. And so they, you're, you're unexpected out there in the middle of the road for most motorists. So please be extremely careful. Let's summarize the motorist excuses. We are invisible, silent, fast moving objects that probably shouldn't be on the roadway in the first place. And even if we are, motorists have the right of way. Not a great situation, but please, Use these to your advantage when you get into a situation where a car can turn right or left in front of you. Okay, what? <laughs> we're having a tough time with this screen. What do you do after a collision? And this is what you're gonna do. Number one, I want you to carry emergency information. There's so many electronic ways to do that these days, but there's also simple ways to do it. Just, you know, carry an old driver's license perhaps, or, or put it on a note card or something. But you should have three pieces of information on there. Number one, of course, your name and address and phone number, but also your emergency contact information. And I would also recommend having the name and phone number of your primary care doctor. Because sometimes in these accidents, you're knocked out cold. And, and they take you to a trauma center and they don't even know who you are. And they can't reach your emergency contact. But if they have your, your, your primary care doctor, they can call him or her and figure out what kind of medications you're on, what kind of medical problems you may have, and they can treat you more effectively. Next one, seek emergency care. If you're laying in the road with a broken leg, don't start crawling across the street. As long as you're out of traffic, you're gonna be fine. And every medical professional will tell you, stay down. Now I have one client who didn't follow this rule. And he started, he started crawling. He, he was in a safe area along the right-hand side of the road. He did have a broken leg. And all of a sudden he's crawling out into the middle of the lane. Now, what would possess a bicyclist to do that? Well, his $13,000 Colnago was out there and he didn't want it to get uh, run over by a car. True story. <laughs> Luckily he survived all this. Listen, if your bike's out in traffic, don't worry about it. Somebody is gonna take care of it. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be handled. The fire department will bring it to you. The police department will maintain it. Just take care of yourself at the scene. Next one: cooperate with the police. They're going to ask you questions about what happened. Tell them what you know. Don't speculate. I mean, if they ask you how fast you were going and you really don't know, and perhaps you hadn't looked down at your computer for a while, say, "Well, I think I, you know, I think I was going approximately." But on the other hand, if you really do know, tell them what the exact uh, speed is. And if you're laying there and you're semi-unconscious or you're in a lot of pain and the police are still asking you questions, you can always ask the officer, listen, I'm really not up to this right now. Would you mind uh, coming down to the hospital later or maybe calling me later so I can give you a more accurate statement? 
Next one, obtain witness information. You know, the police do a pretty good job of this, but they have very busy schedules. They are actually reporting an accident on their forms. They're not investigating your accident. So they get one or two witnesses perhaps, but they don't get them all. So if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I saw the whole thing, well, ask them for their contact information, but don't go walking around looking for it. Chances are, if there is a witness, they're gonna come up to you. Next one, preserve your GPS and digital camera data. We talked about those cases. It is so, so important. Next one, do not alter your bike or cycling accessories. Believe it or not, the damage to your bicycle will tell us really how fast you were going. And we're gonna show some photos later to illustrate that. Same with your accessories, your helmet. You know, don't send it in for a replacement, just hang on to it. If, you, if you're unfortunate enough to have a, a head injury, it's gonna tell us uh, how hard your head was hit perhaps. See your family doctor immediately. I hope you've been to the emergency room and they're probably gonna give you aftercare instructions. And those are gonna be something like follow up with your family doctor as soon as possible. And when you go in to see your family doctor, take a list of all your injuries. Put them on your phone notes, take a note card, because when you go in there, doctors go pretty quickly these days, but, but you wanna document this. Because even if it's not serious, like a bump or a bruise or a scrape, it may get worse later. And you need to document it early and get it in the medical records so that if something does crop up later, you'll be able to say, well, it was caused by the accident. Next one is submit all your medical bills to your health insurance. A lot of people think, well, you know, the driver, it's the driver's fault. Why should my insurance have to pay for this? Well, in California, you have to start with your insurance because the defendant's insurance isn't gonna pay for your medical bills until a year or two down the road when you settle the case. But your health insurance company will be reimbursed. Use your safety net insurance coverages. There are three of them. Let's say uh, you are uh, in an accident and your $13,000 Colnago is a total loss. And let's say the defendant who hit you doesn't have any insurance or doesn't have enough property damage insurance. What are you gonna do? Well, believe it or not, 95% of the time, you can use your homeowner's insurance for this kind of a situation. And if you have a replacement cost policy, you are going to get a brand new bike as opposed to a depreciated value bike. And incidentally, down the road, your uh, insurance company will subrogate against the defendant's uh, auto insurance and try to get their money back. The next safety net insurance is, I've been hit by an uninsured motorist. I've got, I've got medical bills. I've got loss of earnings. I've got pain and suffering. I, what am I going to do? He doesn't have any insurance. Well, believe it or not, your auto insurance will cover you under your uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage. But be careful here for a reason. Your auto insurance, even though it is your insurance and you think they're going to be collaborative and have a, a duty of good faith towards you, they actually don't. They step into the shoes of the person who was driving the car that hit you and they act as if they were their insurance. So before you notify your auto insurance, you really need to talk to a lawyer and make sure you know exactly how to approach that. The third safety net insurance is your homeowner's policy again. And it's in the situation where let's say you're riding down the street, you aren't paying attention, you run a stop sign and you hit a pedestrian and, and you severely injure them. And the pedestrian turns around and files a claim against you. Chances are your homeowners will not only cover you for the claim, but provide lawyers and experts if you have to go to court. It's, a, it, it's something that you always should consider if you're unlucky enough to get in that situation. All right, those are your obligations. Now, let's talk about the legal case, and I'm going to tell you how I do. But first, I'm going to tell you how you win or lose a case. Excuse me, Gary, this is Michael. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I know you're getting into another important section here, but we have a, just a bit of a time check. We have about 20 minutes left, and I'd like to leave a little time uh, for questions and, and so forth at the end. So. I just wanted to give you that uh, the time check there. Sorry about the interruption. Well, thank you very much for reminding me. I appreciate it. I think I'm about five minutes out. Oh, okay, good. I just wasn't sure. Yeah, maybe 10, but 
but I, right. I think I think we're going to get we're going to get there pretty okay. quickly. But okay. thank you for the reminder. I appreciate it. Okay, so how do I handle? It? Let me go back. How do you win a personal injury case? You win or lose these cases not on flowery final arguments or or dramatic moments in the courtroom. You win cases on evidence, good, solid, admissible evidence. In a bicycle case you've got to get it as quick as possible. So here's what I do. First thing I do is get the police report. And it's usually three or four pages long. Sometimes they can be longer in a serious accident, but they have a wealth of information. They have diagrams, they have short witness statements, they have names and addresses of witnesses. They have the name and address of the defendant, his or her insurance company. They really are a great starting point, but they are the tip of the iceberg. So the next thing I do, is I have my private investigator go out and interview the witnesses. You've got to get to them as soon as possible. Memories fade pretty quickly. So she goes out and she gets a recorded statement. And I'm not talking about you know, a five minute statement. She gets about 30 pages worth. So we get to know everything that's good about your case. And we get to know maybe some of the negative points so we can be prepared for those. The next thing is I send my investigator out and she takes scene photos. I want photos of all four directions of the roadway, not just where the accident occurred, because the roadway could change. And like I said, your case could take a year or two to get to court. Also, there may be skid marks that will tell us more about what happened, or even gouge marks from your bicycle, maybe from the pedals. Next thing is obtain building camera footage. My investigator walks the area, looks for cameras, knocks on doors, does whatever she can to obtain that. Next one is look for government infrastructure and vehicle camera footage. You know, a lot of intersections have, have cameras now, government cameras, uh, also vehicle camera uh, footage. A lot of police officers have dash cams in their cars and when they roll up to, a, to, to an accident, they're running. We also have found, as an aside, the defendants who hit, the, hit our clients uh, actually have dash cam coverage, which is striking when, when, you, when, when you see these accidents. But there's one more thing that I don't have on here, but I, but I will add here. And that is body camera coverage from the police officers. It's extremely helpful. Next one is injury photos. I just don't want photos of the broken arm. I want photos of the bumps and bruises and the scrapes because if something goes wrong later, I don't want the other side to say, well, gosh, didn't even hit his knee. Didn't, you know, didn't scrape his elbow, didn't hit his elbow. I wanna make sure we have actual physical uh, photos of that. Next one, property damage photos. Here's the bike I was talking about. Obviously, if this is a left turn situation and the bike T-bones the car, the bike was going pretty fast. That doesn't mean he didn't have the right of way. It just means it's probably going pretty fast. Other bikes have the opposite of this, almost no damage. And that'll tell you that they're going extremely slowly. It's pretty much common sense, but ultimately we, we can bring engineers in to, to measure all of this. Next thing I want in a case is to preserve the client's uh, camera and GPS. We talked about that. And those are the, those are the basic steps uh, in investigating a personal injury case. The rest of the case is procedure. Again, if you've got a great foundation and evidence, you're gonna have a good result in the case. Let me just take another minute. Michael, I know we're coming up. I've got maybe yeah, two minutes. Yeah, we're good. Yep. And I'll be finished up. Okay, so when you're out on the road, I want you to always wear your helmet. 85% of brain injuries or deaths are prevented by these helmets and the statistics have been solid. Always ride defensively when you're in a position where a car can turn right or left in front of you. And always remember the motorist excuses. Please use them to your advantage. And if you're unlucky enough to get into a bike accident, first thing you wanna do is get to your doctor. Next thing is, if you think your rights were violated, get to a lawyer immediately. But most importantly, get well and get back on your bike. Thank you again for having me over this evening. I'll stick around for questions. All right, well, thank you, Gary. This is great. I know I have a few questions, but at least one came up on that on the chat and uh, if you have others, uh, uh, folks on the phone or on the on the Zoom call, please drop them into the chat. 
This one is from Deb, and she said it's regarding sovereign immunity. She was on a ride three weeks ago and found a friend unconscious, had a brain bleed, which is sad. It, um, road repair was still fresh, snippy with big rocks, clearly uh, harmful, negligent for, for bikers. What is the standard of care for a municipality? This was in Orinda. Well, this is known as a government liability case. And you have to prove that the government either created a hazard or allowed a hazard to remain there uh, for a long enough period of time that they should have known about it and done something about it. These are very complicated, difficult cases because the governments have set up uh, higher hurdles in these cases and more of them because they just don't want you to have their tax dollars. And they have set up a high number of defenses and things called immunities. And this is what she's talking about. It's not really quote sovereign immunity, it's immunity from a prosecution in a civil case. So, at the beginning of my practice, I handled a lot of these. I'm no longer handling them, uh, but you have to be aware that there are very short time deadlines in a government liability case. You only have six months to file a preliminary claim with the state, county, uh, or city, or perhaps even federal government. So if you have a colleague or a friend who's been injured, uh, I want you to know they have to do something very fast if they can. There are exceptions to that, but they're very narrow. And government liability cases are difficult, but not impossible. But you need to get on them as soon as possible and collect your evidence, uh, kind of filter it through the law, and then evaluate uh, the pluses and minuses of the case. Okay, that's great. Deb, do you have any other follow-up questions uh, to Gary on that one? Oh, no. I found your talk helpful. And you answered my question responsibly. Thank you. Yeah, it was just such a, you know, clear case of not thinking. <laughs> but no, I, I, I accept that. Um, Great. Thank you, Deb, for surfacing this. This one uh, came from... Uh, Ian and uh, Ian, you know, uh, why don't you share it directly rather than me just reading it? To, uh, sure. sure. Um, speaking of advocacy, I work with Bike East Bay as volunteer for hazard reporting, and we get hazard reports. And this cyclist in Berkeley crashed from a pothole. Speaking of city liability, um, the, the he it required stitches. And the police officer uh, called him the next day and said, you want to file a report? And he uh, ended up not filing a report because the police officer said, beware, if you file a report, your insurance, or he said, uh, pothole crashes are due to distracted riding. And therefore, uh, you're at fault as a cyclist. And the fellow says, listen, I, I hit a lot of potholes. I ride daily. I'm not a, and I was not going fast. Um, he reported, and the officer repeated it twice to him. Watch out. You're going to get insurance uh, uh, premium increases uh, because of this. It's your fault. And um, so he didn't make a report. And, but he did call his insurance agent. And the insurance agent said, that's ridiculous. So we're... Uh, recommending that he go to the city of Berkeley, make a complaint to the, to the city, uh, city administrator and, and also the police department. But have you ever heard of that uh, police report kind of feedback? I, I have not actually heard it from a police officer. I have seen it in police reports where they clearly blame the bicyclist over and over again, unfortunately. But here's the good news under the law, the officer's opinion in the police report is not admissible in a courtroom. So that's number one. Number two, your friend's insurance agent is absolutely right. And number three, you're on the right course talking about filing a complaint. Just so you know, most police departments have complaint forms. I mean, they don't put them out on the front desk when you walk in, but if you do wanna make a complaint against the police department or a particular officer, I would suggest you either go to the website and see if you can access it there or call the police department and yes, something should be said 
about that police officer. That is, uh, that is not his or her job. Their job is to investigate quickly uh, and get the information as quickly as possible and make the report if necessary. Now, they don't always have to make a report, but I can see what this officer was doing, in my opinion, perhaps thinking, well, you know, maybe I just won't have to make a report if I can discourage this person. But that, uh, is not, but, that, but that is not good police work and it shouldn't be excused. Like I said, I'm speculating a little bit here, uh, but, but I, would, I would make a complaint to the police department. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what he suggested. I haven't heard back yet. I hope he does. I, I'm gonna follow yeah. up. Okay. Thanks. Good You're evening. welcome. Yeah. Great. Um, we have another question coming from Matt Haber. Uh, Matt, how about you, you unmute and, and share your question directly with Gary? Sure, and, and this, this also comes from a personal experience uh, where um, no injury, but I hit a pothole in Oakland, filed a claim uh, with documentation and their contractor, they actually farmed the statute of contractor, denied the claim on the basis that um, state law says in order to be held liable, the city or whatever government agency needs to have been told about the problem in advance and fail to remedy the problem in order for it to be liable. I wonder if you can comment on that, Gary. That is the concept of notice under the law. In other words, the, the governmental entity has to have notice of the problem so they can go out there and fix it. Uh, Matt, all I can tell you is there's all types of notice. There's actual notice or perhaps some, some, some uh, 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 utility vehicle from the city drove by and saw it or a police officer saw it and called it in. But there's also something called constructive notice or should have known notice. Now, uh, if it's been out there for three or four weeks, uh, they should have known. Some city vehicle probably should have gone by and, and made a note of it. Uh, but again, these cases are not black and white. So your friend, if, if he wants to proceed, really should uh, a consult with an attorney that does government liability cases, let the attorney do the investigation and evaluate the case. Uh, once again, don't let other people discourage you from asserting your rights. And most personal injury lawyers will always give you a complimentary consultation. So you really uh, are, are not, uh, you have really nothing to lose by calling somebody who does these kinds of cases. Super. Hey, I'll, I'll take the, uh, uh, the, the uh, organizer's uh, prerogative and ask one last question and we can... Uh, wrap up. Um, Gary, if in the event that one is, um, let's say, hit but not seriously injured and the, and the driver pulls over, and so you're, you're looking at someone, they're looking at you, your, your bike may be kind of a little bashed up or, or you may have sustained a little bit of a scrape, it's not an ambulance uh, situation. What's your counsel or advice on how to interact with someone who uh, hit you if they're, you know, denying it or whatever? How do you approach that? You know, get their contact info, take a photo of their license plate. What, what's the procedure there that you would recommend? Well, first of all, use your common sense. Uh, people can be rather uh, difficult these days. Uh, so at, at a minimum, get a picture of their license plate. That's number one, or write it down. Uh, better than that, take a photograph of their driver's license if they'll give that to you, or just get their name and phone number. That's really all you need. You don't necessarily have to sit there and talk to them for hours. Just get the, that information. And uh, if they don't want to stick around, let them go. If it's not a serious injury and you can get off, off the road on your own and ride away, that's fine. If on the other hand, the injury is a little more serious, I would recommend calling 911 and getting the officers out there. But again, Michael, you, you really want to kind of minimize your, 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 your persistent or aggressive behavior, if, if there is any, uh, with folks out on the road. If there's anything going on like that, call the police immediately. But at the minimum, get the license plate yeah. and uh, we can track that down and go from there. Okay, super, great. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up and just thank you uh, so much. I mean, this has been just an incredibly well-organized and thoughtful and information-filled presentation. And on behalf of everyone, really thank you uh, so very much for, for making the time and, and sharing 
with us. And uh, everyone on the on the Zoom call has Gary's uh, website and his name. And I, I trust that um, you'll write it down and store it away. And uh, hopefully, we'll never need it. Uh, you know that's for sure. But if uh, something comes up, um, I think Gary's your 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 first call. Um, I, I wanted to just pause a moment here. Um, 